Super. All right, welcome. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to part two of our four part series called Flutter By, uh, thinking about how we can support our pollinator friends um, around New York City. Um, today, I'm really excited to be with Krishna Murphy of the Bronx River Alliance and Talima Wilson Evans of Learn and Play Party and Friends. Um, so let's do a little introduction before, before we dive into today's discussion. So as y'all know, my name is Nathan Hunter and I am with the Bronx River Alliance um, and I help run, run an edible food forest out of Concrete Plant Park called the Bronx River Foodway. Um, it's the first series of edible gardens inside of a city park um, where folks can go and forage for some of their favorite foods, including blueberries and raspberries and mint and other great things. Uh, I'm excited to be joined by my coworker, Christian Murphy, um, and would love to hand it off to Christian to introduce himself. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, yeah, so my name is Christian Murphy. I'm the ecology coordinator at the Bronx River Alliance. And so a big part of what I do is I run programming for students and volunteers who wanna get a little bit of science research experience. Um, so folks can come on down, um, practice taking water quality measurements and learning a little bit about the environment. Um, and I collect the data along with these students and volunteers. Um, and together we kind of just learn about the health of the Bronx River, um, a little bit about the pollution that we're finding and how we can make things better. Um, and so I love to work with volunteers and with students to just kind of figure out solutions so that we can keep the Bronx River a healthy and beautiful place. Yes, and overall that is our mission to make sure that the river is a vital, healthy resource for our communities and the corridor through which it flows. Um, so, so grateful, Christian, for you to join us. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Talima to do a little introduction. Thanks, Talima. Hey, Talima, you're Talima. muted. <laughs> Sorry, it's everybody. So hi, my name is Salima and I'm the owner and operator of Learn and Play Party Friends, which is a play-based educational party service that's dedicated to hosting um, activities for events, schools, parties, whatsoever. And lately it's been morphing into basically an educational um, service for families and communities. Um, I've connected with Nathan um, and Bronx River Alliance in 2021, when Learn and Play Party Friends was um, <clears throat> hosting um, a homeschool-based educational um, citizen science project. It was for public speaking for some of the younger kids um, that was working with the homeschool community at that time. And we had the opportunity to research, to raise, <laughs> research and raise um, butterflies and learn about their pollinating um, support support to our ecosystems here in in the city. And we I was able to connect with Bronx River Alliance and actually release our butterflies at Concrete Plant Park June of 2021. So that was the first time we were able to get together, meet, connect, and make a wonderful day of learning about butterflies, teaching the community about butterflies and how they support our ecosystems as pollinators. And, and release them in the beautiful uh, concrete plant park. Yes, that was such a magical day. And that was really the catalyst for the series. Um, that was the beginning of the series. And um, we're hoping that this becomes a tradition. So glad y'all are joining us and able to learn alongside us as we go through today's um, discussion about how to build native pollinator habitats. So without further ado, let's just go right on in. I will say, let's just do a little recap for those that missed our first uh, first series last week or two weeks ago, um, which was diving into pollinators, the, the insects and the animals. Um, so we learned that pollinators are the creatures, are the animals and insects that actually do the work of pollination. And pollination impacts our, our lives every single day. Anytime you pick up an apple or food, um, odds are a pollinator was involved in the process of creating that, that, that food. So on the bottom left, you'll actually see a bee taking pollen from that first flower and bringing it from the anther, which is that yellow part, and bringing it to the stigma, which is that green part. And that green part actually would turn into the fruit. So without these bees and butterflies doing this job, um, we would not have the food we all love. We all love to eat and need to survive. Um, we also learned that bees and butterflies and all pollinators 
you know, there are two categories. There are the specialists and then there are the generalists. The specialists have very specific jobs and are very picky about what they eat. Um, they, are, they specialize in um, and adapted with certain plants. So on the top here, you'll see an image of a bee just going in on a, on a blueberry plant, a blueberry flower. And that bee evolved to support blueberries. So there's a special bee out there that is the only type of bee that can pollinate blueberries. That's a specialist. Now, generalist bees, that's actually about 75% of the bee population. Um, things like honeybees, they're, they're generalists. They will forage from all different types of flowers, not one specific flower. So on the bottom, you'll see a honey a honeybee enjoying an aster plant. And asters are a great flower for all types of pollinators, not just bees. Now we learned about all the diversity, right? Pollinators aren't just bees and they're not just butterflies. They also include moths and other, and other insects. And you'll also notice that depending on their life cycle, they'll look different. So on the top right, we see that a monarch caterpillar looks very different than the monarch butterfly. And a moth um, looks very different than its larvae. So we wanna make sure that when we see the caterpillars, we remember that they may be in the process of evolving and turning into its final uh, mature insects. So like the butterfly or the moth. Let's see what other, what other insects we learned about other pollinators. So we learned about wasps. Wasps are actually a really important pollinator. We learned about bees already. We learned about flies. Flies are actually a really critical pollinator in our environment, as well as beetles. The most common is a lady beetle or a ladybug. Um, here we have some emerald beetles. And then we can also look at our birds and remember that they also support our pollination process. In particular, the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is a native hummingbird to the Northeast. And some of you might remember this hummingbird from Pocahontas, the Disney movie, um, where Flick plays a major, a major character in that, in that movie. And that is a native hummingbird to the Northeast. So you can find these, but they're very rare and they move very fast. So that's a quick recap on pollinators. And I wanna encourage you as we go through today's conversation to use the chat feature. If you have thoughts or ideas, you can put them right in the chat and share with us. And we'll be reading that throughout the whole entire um, next hour. But the real question is what are habitats? So I'm curious, anyone out there, what comes to mind when you think of a habitat or even when you see this image? Feel free to unmute or you can add to the chat. I guess I think of a lot of different places <laughs> as habitats. Um, in Brooklyn, we don't have a lot of, I'm in Bushwick for people who haven't met me. Um, and we don't have a lot of green spaces down here in my area. So I think about the trees along the street and whether or not those constitute habitats on their own to some degree and then how they work together and how they work together with like the rain gardens along the street also and um yeah it's interesting because it's a different kind of habitat it's like very concrete and <laughs> buildings but then there's also like people's plants and and trees and little spots here and there you bring up such a good point audrey do all habitats look like this image well we'll actually learn that a habitat is simply a place where a plant or animal lives right habitats are often where Animals will also find food, water, and yeah, of course, shelter. Now, the real question is, do all habitats look the same? Um, and I'm gonna tap on my friend Christian to answer this question. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so no, as you can see from these images, all habitats do not look the same. Um, if you walk through a uh, concrete plant park or you walk through um, Jamaica Bay in Brooklyn, you will see that those two spaces, although they're both in New York City, can look very different from each other. Um, so it really depends on what's in the environment, right? So if you live near the ocean, your habitats are gonna be a little different than if you live on top of a mountain. Um, and the animals and plants that are in these spaces are specially adapted for these different conditions. So if we look at the screen right here, 
Um, the first one, alpine pollinators. Alpine is a habitat that you find um, high up, high altitude um, locations that are high up on mountains. They're often kind of harsh. They can be quite dry and cold. Sometimes there's snow. But these are still great places to find flowers and to find bees and butterflies. Um, and they're gonna look very different from your desert pollinators, right? So these locations that are lower down, hot and dry. When you think of a desert, you don't necessarily think of a lush you know, location with big, beautiful, bright flowers, but these flowers actually can still exist in these dry locations. They just live their lives a little differently. And so in each of these locations, the plants and animals that you find have very special adaptations that match the conditions. So when you would um, go to a mountain, you're not gonna look for a plant that you might find in a desert, right? So you're probably not gonna find a cactus on top of a mountain where there's snow, right? But you would find a cactus down in the desert and cacti are actually a really important plant because they produce some really, really nectar rich flowers. Um, so in a desert, for example, you will find bats and butterflies and hummingbirds all eating from the same flowers that are growing on a cactus, right? These prickly kind of painful looking plants that humans don't really like to touch too much. Um, they're such important plants for pollinators. So everywhere you go, you're gonna find these creatures that are specially adapted for the conditions that they've, um, you know, that are in, uh, that are present. Excellent, thank you so much, Christian. Yeah, so just remember, you know, every everyone looks different based on their environment. They adapt to their environment. Um, and that's over, over thousands, if not millions of years, um, these plants and animals shape their environment. Now, we were talking about New York City. So what do pollinator habitats in New York City look like? This is one of my favorite. This is close to home. This is Concrete Plant Park. Um, and you can see here people foraging flowers and enjoying the space just as much as pollinators are enjoying the space. On the right side, you'll see a close-up of a monarch um, as well as a wasp that is enjoying two different plants that are growing at the foodway. The wasp is actually enjoying uh, late bone set which is the white flower in the main image. Um, and you can see that it's all over. And late boneset is actually a fall flower. So we're providing food for the fall uh, pollinators. Um, so habitats can look like gardens, right? Just like this one. But also as, as uh, Audrey was talking about earlier, habitats can look like different things. Christian, you wanna talk about the images that you pulled forward? Yeah, so I took these images on a particular day last summer on my way to work. Um, the first two are actually in East Harlem, and the last one is right here at the Bronx River. Um, and I was just kind of walking around. It was a warm June day, and I was thinking to myself, you know what? This is some great pollinator habitat. We had some plants. We had some flowers. We had some shelter. Um, we had, you know, exactly the things that all these creatures need. I mean, if you think about a habitat, um, you have the same things in your own home as these creatures are looking for. You've got a place to sleep. You've got food and water to eat and drink. Um, and you have a shelter over your head to keep you protected. And that's all these creatures need, right? So as we're walking through New York City or wherever town or location you happen to be in, if you think about the fact that like, if you have garbage in your hand and you throw it, you could be damaging a habitat. You could be harming creatures without even realizing um, that you're putting your garbage right in their home. So as we're walking around these places and, and you know, living um, and doing our, our daily lives, we should be mindful about the fact that there is habitat all around us. Humans just occupy the environment and we have created a habitat that suits our needs. Um, but we need to be mindful that there are other creatures who have very special needs too. Um, and so, for example, in New York City, there are places where um, plants will grow out of the concrete. That becomes a habitat. If you have um, a flower pot on your balcony, that becomes a habitat. And actually in New York City alone, um, people putting flowers out on their apartment building balconies is a really important thing for our native bee species in New York City. Um, they're very secretive, they're very shy, they're kind of hard to see, but they are there. And so if you're taking good care of your um, balcony plants or if you have a fire escape that's got flowers on it, you're actually doing a really important job for New York City's bees. Um, so pat yourself on the back. Um, and if you were thinking about getting some flowers, please, please do. Um, it goes a long way in a city like New York. Um, our trees, the flowers that grow out of the pavement and our parks are all really important components or pieces of this puzzle that we call the ecosystem. 
Um, and so these, these habitats exist naturally all around us. Um, and the more that we're aware of them is the better we can take care of them and the healthier that our pollinators will be. I love this reminder that even the smallest of places are our habitats and a reminder that we need to protect, right, those spaces. Um, even if for some of us, we consider them weedy or unsightly. Um, if you look close enough, you'll actually notice uh, insects thriving. Um, and those insects are quite possibly pollinators. Now, a lot of you probably are wondering, okay, so now that I'm excited about, poll about pollinator spaces, how can I actually build one? Um, you know, Christian ma made a good point that you can just use your, your balcony or a windowsill to start that process. But you might be wondering, all right, well, like what plants do I plant, right? Um, or what seeds do I buy? Um, you wanna first focus on plants that are native to the region. And native plants um, are perfect for native pollinators. We always wanna be centering and promoting native plants because it's our native species that are often under attack by new species that are entering our, our region. So the more variety we can offer that includes shapes, colors and sizes of flowers, the more likely pollinators will be able to thrive in that setting or just be really happy. Something else I learned is that you want large groupings of the same plant. It's really nice to have three or more of the same plant because to the bee they're a or to the pollinator, they're able to see the color. And to them, that is super important as they're flying above to identify locations um, to then go forage. So color is a big, a big reason that uh, pollinators uh, actually can find plants. Um, but shapes and sizes of those flowers are also equally important. So get big flowers, get small flowers, get flowers with tons of clusters of flowers like this milkweed on the top right. Those are all really important things to think about. And as we continue thinking about how to build a pollinator habitat, we need to think about the seasons. A lot of us are really eager to plant stuff in, um, you know, for the peak of summer. But what about all the pollinators that are emerging out of winter? And what about all the pollinators that are preparing for winter? We need to think about every single season and make sure that our garden has flowers all times of year. Um, you can even consider how your garden is a habitat for the winter months. So I didn't include winter in these, in these images, but um, in the winter, although there are no flowers, that is an important time to consider, how is my garden actually providing shelter or a hiding place or a resting place for, uh, for bees and butterflies and all, all different types of insects, pollinators in particular, to hide to protect themselves from the cold temperatures over the winter. Um, in the images you're, you're seeing, you can see chamomile and blue hill sage on the left side. Both are really popular for foraging um, from pollinators. And then on the right side, and those are spring and summer, early summer. And then uh, midsummer and all the way through the fall, you can, you can plant echinacea and black-eyed Susans, which are a really popular food, um, as well as shelter for our insects. In the winter, these plants, uh, the echinacea and black-eyed Susans, um, die back and their hollow stems are the perfect place to hide over winter. Nathan, I just, I wanna point out, I love that in these images, you've got so many different colors happening here. We've got the blue and the white and the pink and the yellow. Um, and why do we think that we would want all these different colors together in the same habitat? Well, if you think about if you were gonna have breakfast, lunch and dinner throughout the day, you probably wouldn't wanna eat the same thing for every meal. So just kind of like how humans have different health requirements, pollinators do too. And so the different variety of plants that you see will be feeding different types of pollinators. And so you'll be attracting different species. So you'll have butterflies, you'll have bees, you'll have moths. If you've got really deep flowers, you might even get a hummingbird. Um, so the more different um, variety or different types of flowering plants that you have in a space is the more diverse or variety of pollinators that you'll be attracting. And I love that these images are showing that. Thanks, Christian. So other considerations we wanna have are whether or not your plants are also food. So we've been talking a lot about shelter and also about food, I guess, but we wanna think about actually the larval, larvae stage. So 
um, on the right side, you'll actually see a spice bush swallowtail larvae. It's a cool, it's a cool caterpillar because it looks like a snake, which is intentional. It wants to actually appear to be a snake so that birds don't eat it. But what I like about this, this caterpillar is its name because its name actually indicates which plant you should be planting. It's called a spice bush swallowtail larvae. So I pulled up an image of the spice bush, um, which is a, a native uh, shrub that grows here in our understory. So just below the biggest trees, the spice bush grows um, in our forest. And without them, we would not have um, swallowtails. So in particular, uh, the spice bush swallowtail. Now on the other side, I wanted to just remind folks that there's a variety of swallowtails. So the black swallowtail, they love anything in the family of the carrots. So the dill plant right here can be seen and a black swallowtail larvae is just chomping away. So for those who are looking to raise, in, uh, raise butterflies but don't necessarily wanna buy um, but, uh, caterpillars from online, you can actually just plant these host plants, these larval host plants, and the, the caterpillars will come to you. And then once you find the caterpillars, you can use the same equipment, the same type of setup to raise your own pollinator inside. I've even heard of people placing the baskets or the, the cages right over the plant in, the, in their garden and not actually bringing it inside, but allowing the caterpillar to stay outside and still having that opportunity to watch it um, uh, metamorphosize. Um, so I wanna remind people, you know, we don't want plants that are just beautiful. We want plants that are also feeding the babies, right? Feeding the larvae. So just, just ask yourself and consider, are these plants food and, or are they shelter? All right, I know a lot of people are joining us thinking about monarchs today um, or thinking about raising butterflies. And this is a, a hot topic. I know Talima, when it comes to milkweed, uh, you know a lot about it, or you know, you know quite a bit. You know that monarchs love milkweed. Um, so I, I wanted to just take a minute to identify and uplift three different species of milkweed um, that are all delicious, <laughs> that, uh, that our monarchs find delicious. I personally don't eat these, although with proper care, humans can eat them, but today is about insects and pollinators eating them. So these three species of milkweed, um, the common milkweed, um, as well as butterfly weed in the middle, and then swamp milkweed are really wonderful to be planting in this region. And they're not just wonderful for insects, they actually smell really incredible too. So if you're a human out there who wants something that's just equally as beautiful and aromatic, um, milkweed is the way to go. So these are three species I wanna identify. And the swamp milkweed is a great one for those wet soils. So if you have a garden that floods or an area in your garden that has a water issue and you just want to plant something there, this is a great one. Um, actually, in general, milkweed is pretty resilient to both drought and um, uh, wetlands or like wet feet, I say. Um, but in particular, swamp milkweed is known for being able to handle um, very wet soils. Christian or Nathan. Talima? Yeah. <laughs> you knew. You knew I had something to say. Um, I want to point out each of these also has different shade tolerances. So a lot of people might be like, well, I always see milkweed out in the sun, but I've got a little bit of shade. I can't maybe grow milkweed. Actually, swamp milkweed will tolerate being a little shady, um, whereas a butterfly weed really wants all that hot sunlight. So depending on where you are, you can actually plant different species of milkweed to suit your needs. And different species of milkweed bloom at different times of year. So how Nathan was saying, you know, you want to think about your spring blooms and your summer blooms and your fall blooms. Well, if you want to have continuous milkweed, you can plant different species and they will grow at different times throughout the year and give you a continuous supply of these beautiful flowers. Thank you, Christian, for that. And I was just responding um, to Ronan's uh, message, just like acknowledging that this plant has the word weed in it. And a lot of people will assume that just because it's been categorized as a weed by some, 
that it means that it has no value. And what we should all take away today is that just because the name has weed in it does not mean that it's a bad plant or something to be ripped out and thrown away, but instead maybe something to read more about and try to figure out why it's called that. Um, we often call things weeds when they grow with a lot of vigor, a lot of energy, and they take up a space. They occupy a large space. So I will say that um, milkweeds are very good at, at spreading their seed and taking, um, like replanting those seeds every single season in that area. So at some point, if you only have one milkweed plant, imagine um, you can almost predict that uh, by next year, you're going to have a lot more milkweed. So. But yeah, thank you, Christian, for, for saying all that. Talima, any thoughts about milkweed as we, <laughs> as we center on it for a moment? Um, only that it's absolutely necessary <laughs> when you are raising um, painted lady uh, caterpillars. So yeah, absolutely. But they're beautiful. So I love finding out that you can um, plant all three of them and then watch them grow throughout each season. So that's something I'm definitely looking into doing. Awesome. Um, and I will say their seeds are really easy to come by in the fall. So if you're someone who's thinking ahead and you wanna actually go out and harvest seeds, this is one of the easiest uh, plants to collect seeds from in the late fall. Um, they almost have like a little, a little bag <laughs> attached to the plant that is just a pocket full of seeds. And just like dandelions, once you open up that little, that little pocket, um, all the seeds fly into the air and they soar through the skies. And that's how they're able to um, spread and uh, yeah reseed for next year's butterflies. So uh, Christian, I know we talk about this a lot as we do maintenance or take care of spaces, but we wanna think about how, what are some other ways besides planting these, these species like that we can actually support our pollinators? Um, and these are two things that, that we were discussing. What are you thinking? Yeah, good question. So um, a lot of times human beings really want to keep things nice and tidy. Um, and so in the fall, you probably know the sound of a leaf blower or a lawnmower, or when people raking their leaves because they want their spaces to be tidy. Um, but what suits humans does not always suit our pollinators and our other species that live out in the environment. And actually cleaning up your garden and getting rid of all the leaves is not a good thing for the pollinators because the leaves are a shelter. The leaves become a home and even a food source during the winter months. Um, so a lot of the caterpillars that we're talking about, um, during the warm season, they will grow into butterflies, they will lay more eggs, and they will produce more caterpillars. But at the very end of the season, any caterpillar that is born is crawling around just as it's starting to get cold, is not gonna survive if it's up on some twigs or leaves and it gets really cold and chilly. Um, it just, it's, you know, it's, it's too cold for them that they actually do is they drop down into the leaves and they kind of hide down there under all the leaves later and they stay warm and it's kind of like they wrap themselves up in a little blanket and wait for spring to come. But if you get rid of those leaves, then you've gotten rid of that place for that caterpillar to shelter and protect itself. Um, so an untidy garden during the fall is actually a great thing. The shaggier it is, the more branches and sticks and leaves and, and things you've got going on there is the more shelter you've, you're providing for those pollinators so that they can survive through the winter. Um, so this is kind of something that humans are a little, you know, we're struggling with this concept a little bit because we really want things to look nice and clean and tidy, um, but it's not what our pollinators want. Um, so you have to kind of balance out, but you want to see what your kind of like ideal image for a beautiful garden is um, and what a healthy garden is. Um, and you can absolutely, you know, compromise um, and find different ways to provide for both of those things. Um, I also want to point out that you will need to cut back um, your growth in late spring. Um, you want to provide space for flowers to grow um, and a little bit of maintenance um, does help to encourage more, more blooming and, and healthier flowers for the new year. And all of this work helps to keep the garden happy and healthy. I say garden, but it could be your flower box on your balcony. It could be, you know, maybe you've got a little patch of flowers that grow outside your building. Um, and you just take it upon yourself to take care of them. Any little maintenance that you can do um, with these things in mind um, will help to have happier and healthier pollinators. Yes, and I'm loving the chat right now. I'm just 
uh, in love with the idea of like falling, I'm in love with the idea of falling back in love with leaves and remembering that like, maybe there's, uh, Audrey is mentioning, maybe there's some clever ways to use leaves to make, you know, make a leaf box, right? Or to like organize it. For me, I think humans really um, are drawn to clean lines. And that's why we really appreciate having that mulch against the plants and orderly lines. It's just, it's really relaxing. Um, so I think about like, could we just arrange the leaves so that they look a little more like organized at the end of fall um, and less haphazard? Um, or even consider cutting back last year's growth to a degree. So maybe the top of them have been ruined by the winter storms um, or even by, you know, people just by banging them and stuff like that. Maybe you cut it back by a foot, but still leave most of the stem. Something else I've also heard is you just leave those, uh, you cut back some of that last year's growth, the old dry material, but you leave it at the base of the plant. And that still leaves, that still leaves room or gives opportunity for those insects to remain in that location and not be displaced or be pushed out of the way. So there's a couple ways to rethink this. And I, I really appreciate everyone kind of tagging along and rethinking how to do maintenance in our gardens. All right, so native grasses. Why are they important, Christian? I appreciate you bringing the slide in to our, uh, into this group. Yeah, so we don't often think about grass when we think about pollinators, because we don't actually think about flowers when we think about grass. Um, but in the same way that the leaves and the sticks and branches at the end of the season can provide a habitat for pollinators, grasses actually do the same thing all throughout the year. Um, and a lot of our native bee species here in the United States actually live inside grass. We often think about bees building a big beehive and producing a lot of honey, right? Because we all know what honey tastes like, but that's just honeybees. It's even in the name, right? Honeybees produce the honey. The other bees may not even live in a nest. They might actually live underground. Um, a lot of our bees along the Bronx River are actually ground nesting bees. And they actually build their nests in the soil. Um, sometimes we can see them poking their little heads out. There's like lots of little holes along the Bronx River. And sometimes the bees are coming out of those holes. It's very cute. Um, but what they really want above them are these native grasses for shelter. Um, and so in the, when there are places that the grass has been cut down or it's been replaced by plants that are unfamiliar to the bees, we start to see these pollinators disappear. So replacing those native grasses, putting them back where they used to be, will bring the pollinators back. And it's not just the bees that want those grasses too. Dozens and dozens of butterflies and moth species actually feed their caterpillars on native grasses. And as you might've guessed, some of those species are endangered. Um, so as we're cutting down our grasses, because we don't, you know, we don't think they're as important, um, we could accidentally be harming some of these species. Um, and so there are certainly some butterflies along the east coast of North America um, that aren't doing so well and could benefit from more native grasses. Um, there's a beautiful one called the Baltimore checker spot. Um, it's a gorgeous, cute little butterfly. Um, and if we only had more of its native grasses, we could start to build up that population again. So as you're thinking about um, a habitat space, um, if you've got the room for it, if you're able to also provide a space for a grass, um, I would consider doing that too. That's such a great reminder. I mean, I think a lot of us mow the lawn without even realizing what we could be doing. I think also it's good for us um, to stress native grasses, not just any type of grass seed you're throwing down, um, but specifically species uh, that, are, that are from this region, right? So thinking again, um, and I will be sending out, just for those that are already starting to surf the internet, trying to figure out what these species are, I will send uh, to those that have registered just the, um, the links to all these species lists um, that will help guide your decisions in purchasing seeds and starting um, native plants for your gardens um, to support pollinators. But grasses are a definitely an important aspect. And at the Foodway, we have a bunch of native grasses um, that support pollinators, but also support our bird species. So um, these, these plants can be beneficial in many ways. <laughs> so that is kind of our like 101 on how to build a native plant um, pollinator habitat. Um, I wanted to share with y'all some resources um, that, are, that are coming coming our way or that are available for us all. Uh, there's different grants out there, um, but I also wanted to acknowledge for those that are starting, looking to start things by seed, 
to consider um, just asking seed companies straight up uh, for donations. Uh, most of my seeds I don't purchase, I get for free. Um, and not just because I work for a nonprofit and a government institution, but in, but just because the companies naturally do that. They naturally give away seeds because they understand the importance. Um, I will also say consider saving seeds in the fall. Um, the image on the right here is of Anise Hyssop and this plant produces tons of seeds. Each year we are, hastily teaching people how to collect seeds. So in the fall, you can join us in collecting your own anise hyssop or just ask me and I'm happy to give you some anise hyssop seeds. Um, and that leads me to the last thing of just like talk to a local group or ask a friend if they have any seeds that you might be able to start on your own. Um, I know New York City is a big place with lots of people, but a lot of us are talking about pollinators and a lot of us want to do, um, do more to support them. Um, and so I'll share out these links um, after today's call. Um, and then just additional ways to support, you know, we mentioned talking to a friend. So not just asking them for seeds, but also informing them of today's information, right? Telling them about the diversity of insects, telling them that even the smallest of little green spaces on the street are super important pollinator habitats. Um, you can also join advoca an advocacy group to advocate for our pollinators in New York City. Um, NYC Pollinator Working Group is a group of volunteers that you can, you can plug in and and support um, either educational materials or, or even plantings. Um, and they have a exciting Monarch Festival um, that is planned on October 1st at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, so some exciting things happening. And then I will just acknowledge iNaturalist I and NYC Ecoflora. Um, those are two great avenues to learn more about pollinators and to get in touch um, with the natural world. And um, this week, or not this week, next week, we're actually kicking off City Nature Challenge, um, which Christian and some other folks, myself included, along the river, will actually be going out to Bronx Park to uh, to identify all the different species growing in that in that park um, using the iNaturalist app, um, and that's a, an easy free app that you can download on your phone and take images, uh, click images or take photos of the plants in your surrounding and all that information gets uploaded to a database so that both scientists and your everyday person can understand what is growing and thriving in our in our ecosystems. So you yourself during this time can also be a researcher. Um, and then I just, I just, yeah, please, Christian. Oh, actually, I think I can wait, I think. <laughs> cool, um, I will just like plug on May 7th, uh, we will be doing a cleanup that day, but um, if you're looking to plug in in the pollinator world on May 7th, uh, you can uh, come out to uh, Grove Hill Community Learning Garden, um, where, where they will be doing a native plant share. So if you're interested in, in gathering some plants or learning more about um, uh, learning more about pollinators, you can join that day. And I will share details in our follow-up email. Christian, do you have something else to add on? I wanted to uplift Jack and Leo's question in the chat if we're going to give this information out via email. So, yes, absolutely. We definitely will, Jack and Leo. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and I just welcome, I'm like trying to think, I'm, yeah, I welcome anyone else to either unmute or if you want to drop in the chat any questions. I feel like we were looking through the chat pretty well, but if you have something we miss, please uh, feel free to, to jump on. Yeah, just a quick follow up from some of the chat um, towards the end there about tidiness. Um, if you keep these spaces free from trash and litter, um, that will help to discourage pests from moving in. Because a lot of times pests are not really looking at these spaces the same way that a pollinator is. Um, they want to sit and eat some garbage and hide from the public. <laughs> Um, so the cleaner that these spaces are, if we don't, you know, put trash or drop a bunch of potato chips and, you know, all these things in these spaces, that will discourage pests from moving in. Such a great point. Sometimes these things can be at an odd, like at, at <laughs> working against each other, but yeah, thinking about a balance. I just I also saw Ronan's question. Oh, I'm so I'm sorry. sorry. You can go ahead. I was just going to ask a follow up about how pollinators find, especially like the specialists find plants and if there's an, a, um, 
is it important, like you mentioned, having multiple plants might help because then it's easier for them to see the plant that they're looking for. But if there aren't plants nearby that like help them like connect the dots basically over to to the plant, is it just unlikely that they'll find it? Or I don't know if you have any like thoughts about how important it is to have like connecting habitats to help insects travel, I guess. Is that a thing? Yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, and it's a really big concern in urban spaces um, and agricultural spaces too, even. Um, yeah, we call that fragmentation, habitat fragmentation. When you've taken a habitat and you split it up into pieces um, with big gaps in between, um, it's not good for the pollinators. They really do want that continuous connecting the dots of one patch to the next patch to the next. Otherwise, they're having to fly over highways or fly over, you know, big patches of concrete, um, and they can get lost. Um, and so, yeah, if you did have some really unique plants on your balcony, for example, in the middle of Brooklyn, which you didn't necessarily live near a park, um, I'm sure that bees would find their way to you, but maybe not the specific bees that you're looking for. Um, and so these specialist species actually are quite sensitive. Um, and I love that you bring up this point our generalist species, they can kind of fend for themselves a little bit better if they don't find maybe their favorite flower, they'll settle for their second favorite flower, right? But if you're a specialist species, you're really looking for very specific plants. And if you can't find it, you're gonna be in trouble. So a lot of our specialist species um, are endangered. They're vulnerable, their populations are decreasing um, because they're having that hard time finding the food and shelter that they're looking for specifically. Um, so the best that we can do right now is to continue to plant up our urban spaces and other spaces um, where we have removed native habitats. So imagine if everyone in New York City, for example, had a green roof or a balcony that was covered in flowers of all different species, we would start to put back some of that habitat that we've removed, right? So in the interim, every little bit helps. Um, and like I said, uh, flower pots on balconies and fire escapes are really important because a lot of our bees actually live, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, they actually live inside our walls. They'll live in the bricks, they'll live in the mortar, um, they'll build little nests that you won't hear and you won't see, but they're right around you. Um, so if you have a, a flower pot on your balcony, now those bees don't even have to fly very far. They're just going to go around the corner straight to you. Yes, I'm seeing so many great chat. The, the chat is just like really giving me life right now. And um, there's some things I want to just uplift. Um, so Ronan, you were asking about uh, seed collection from park, public gardens and parks. I, in general, say that it's fine. <laughs> um, I will say everything in moderation whenever you're taking something, whenever you're foraging or taking seed from a plant, you wanna be considerate of all the other players in that, that ecosystem. So never take all of the seed from that location, right? Only take a couple seed heads and then move on to a new, new spot, take a couple seed heads, move on to a new spot, take a couple seed heads and then um, collect them, right? And then you can process them at home later. Um, and I do just wanna uplift that seed swaps are a great place to trade seeds without worry of damaging ecosystems. So I will say this Saturday um, here at Starlight Park from 12 until four, we will be doing a bit of an open house for our, this office that we're actually located in right now. Um, and we will have some seeds for giving out. So if you're interested in some seeds and are available this Saturday, I'll have a seed swap impromptu happening um, from 12 to four, you can come through and grab some pollinator species. Um, and I wanted to just also uplift something Ronan had pulled up, which was um, a conversation around green roofs um, and acknowledging that they are great places for pollinators to um, forage and to find shelter. Um, and that green roofs are also really great for humans, right? Because they keep our buildings um, cool in the summer and warm in the winter by insulating the building. Right? You can imagine a layer of soil on top of your building would trap any heat that is actually escaping the top of your building. So um, how great is it to plant flowers on top of your roof um, if your building is strong enough um, and you have permission from your building manager um, to do that? So I would say that's actually one of the best ways we see um, people expanding pollinator habitats now. Um, Salima. Hi. 
Yeah, when Christian, when you were talking and you were um, speaking about how like our urban spaces, um, the, the thought that came to mind was um, the NYCHA developments. In the NYCHA developments uh, that are all around the city, I've noticed um, that they mow the lawn regularly. And, you know, the leaf cleanup is is consistent. So I'm thinking about that. And then it's an abundance of windows pretty much throughout all of the NYCHA developments. Um, and I'm connecting those dots right there. And I'm wondering how would one go about being able to connect with the NYCHA developments and hopefully um, inspiring a project that could produce or support um, many window gardens for um, the NYCHA developments and educating them about, you know, the leaf habitats and stuff that need to be there for overwintering and, you know, you know, just being able to utilize the spaces that they do have that are available um, and definitely are interacting with our ecosystem and, you know, what we're trying to provide here for the pollinators. Like, how would one go about doing something like that, if you would know? <laughs> That's a really yes. great question. Oh, wow. question. I would just like to <laughs> identify that we have people on the call today from NYCHA um, and some folks who are starting some rain gardens over at Bronx River Houses. And what I've learned in the process of supporting them um, and other folks can please jump in um, is really working within your building. Um, so figuring out who are the people who are taking care of the property, talking to them about this issue. Um, and then I will also just identify that there's usually a association of some sort at each NYCHA building like uh, that brings tenants together to discuss these issues and that is a great place to, to begin the conversation and to share this information and to build support um, and those are also the places that often have some funding to support these these initiatives um, and Finite, I know you're working with Bronx River Houses and I see your hand raised do you want to share? Yes absolutely yeah. so um, I'm definitely listening to what I'm coming up with bringing up into the space and we are definitely establishing, and um, Nathan and Bronx of Alliance are supporting us in establishing um, a GI infrastructure in that space. And we also have a butterfly garden that's supposed to be coming up this spring at Bronx of the Houses. So we've been working on curriculum, and some of this conversation is something that we can bring over to that space and make sure that um, we can create a, a space and time for the Bronx of the community to be aware of this information. So I think that's a good place to start. And if you want to join the conversation with us, that would be greatly appreciated. Definitely, Infinity. I would love to connect with you. Just um, find out how you guys are going about it and um, being able to share whatever wisdom and guidance that you have um, for me so we can do this in other places. Thank you so much. I would definitely yeah. connect with you. That's exactly the page we're on. So it sounds good. Let's do it. I also, I want to uplift uh, a NYCHA housing development in East Harlem that I know of that has beautiful plant boxes in the little courtyard spaces where they're doing most of the mowing and, and raking. And this housing is actually growing crops. They've got sunflowers and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful um, little gardens that I've ever seen um, in NYCHA housing. And it seems like the residents, once they see that there, want to actually pitch in and help out um, to keep the space clean. So actually, I think it could be a way of encouraging folks, you know, um, I do see a lot of people throw litter in the street and, and, you know, not necessarily take care of their space. But if it is already beautiful to begin with, I feel like folks are less likely to want to throw their garbage on the ground and more likely that they would want to help to keep it beautiful. Um, so it could be a way of encouraging folks like, you know, if you invest in this and, and want this for your property, you'll help it to be beautiful. You'll be helping the pollinators and everybody wins. Um, I can try to find out how they got that started. It's around 106th Street and Park Avenue. Um, so I can see if I can find out how they got started and, and what, you know, um, if there was any obstacles into getting that installed, but um, I would love to see that all across New York City and everywhere, really. So I love that question. Thank you for that, those responses. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Jack and Leo, how you doing? Do you have any questions over there? <laughs> well, if, if not, you know, I think this is the end of our conversation today about building habitats. This is just the beginning. Um, 
of the conversation. And I encourage you to come out to the Bronx River Foodway to see our pollinator habitat and how it functions as an ecosystem. And uh, just a reminder, we have two more um, two more events in the series, uh, Flutter By, and we encourage you to sign up for those. Um, the next dates are May 10th and May 24th, where Talima and myself will be talking about raising butterflies. So tune on in. Nathan, thank you so much. The seniors here in Bronx River appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. This was great. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Bye.